record first. I'm really proud of myself for remembering that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, thank you so much, Lucy, for agreeing to give us a Lee Zoominar. Um, this has been a little bit of a, you know, one you do one, I do one. Lucy <laughs> invited me to give a sem seminar. She runs her seminar series at um, the University of Adelaide. So, you know, we've got one for one, which has been really, really good. Um, Lucy um, uh, is a volcanologist. She did her PhD in Auckland in New Zealand um, and then backed that up with a three-year postdoc in um, Chile, um, in Santiago, and then did a postdoc at Macquarie University, which is where we first met, um, and now is a lecturer at the University of Adelaide. Um, works on volcanoes in New Zealand, South America, the Caribbean, and I'm sure lots of other places which you'll tell us about, Lucy. Um, so with that, I'm, I'll let you um, tell us about uh, tiny volcanoes. Great. Thanks very much for the for the invite. Um, it is a bit of an odd sensation doing this on Zoom. So as, as you yourself know, but um, yeah, I have been having some problems with this webcam. So if I suddenly become very quiet, somebody do please yell out and, you know, say speak up or, or so on. So um, thanks for the introduction. That makes me sound extremely glamorous. Speak of the devil. Your webcam has dropped out a bit, I think. I don't know if other people cannot hear. <laughs> I could originally, but can't now. Yeah, it's dropped out. Sorry, Lucy. <laughs> oh, I wonder why. Is that any better? Your, yeah, your audio. Okay. Um, can you give me two minutes? And I'll go on yep, my no one, one second and I will go onto my laptop. Sorry about okay. this. No, no, not right. Um, oh, that's great timing. Okay. Uh, had it set up ready. So hopefully. Maybe we'll get some time for, for a few extra people to drop in. So it's probably yeah. not a bad thing. This is a nice picture to look at for the moment. Yes. <laughs> Great to see all um, everybody logged on. There's lots of people. Um, it's it's awesome to see people logging on to the Lee Zoominars. That's such bad timing. And I'm running uh, the Zoominar today from um, a core library in Brisbane, <laughs> which is very exciting. So we can still run the Zooms no matter where we are. <laughs> that is the good thing about um, yes. I just had to find a quiet space in the office, but then they started printing out all sorts of barcodes and things like that, but everything seems to be good so far on this end. Oh, it's doing an update, can you believe it? So you can't hear me at all? No, I can hear you, it's just very quiet. So I don't know, maybe um, it could be closer to the microphone or something maybe. Um, I can hear it okay. Okay. Okay, can I just carry on? Yeah, maybe you should just carry on if Sorry. people can, if everybody else says all good. Update on my laptop, so super annoying. I'll just try no and worries. talk a bit. No worries. Um, just go for it. Great. So today I want to talk about um, what we can tell about mantle melting from using compositions of very small volcanoes, sometimes called monogenetic volcanoes. Um, so the photograph that I've got on this first slide is of the Antiyanka volcanic complex, which is a really great example of where in southern Chile we see very large, quite obvious strato volcanoes, which are interspersed with these smaller cones, which aren't immediately obvious that they're actually volcanic landforms as well. So just a brief outline of today's talk. I want to start off with why we would bother to study small eruptive centers or monogenetic eruptions. Um, and to use a phrase from my PhD supervisor there, monogenetic volcanoes are a window to the mantle. I'm going to show an example from Auckland, which is an intraplate field, which I would consider to be one of the simpler cases. And then I'll talk about a, um, an arc volcanic um, example in Southern Chile, which is a bit more complex. I want to talk about some ideas that I've had over the past few years working with collaborators on what is compositional heterogeneity, where does it start, and what does it actually relate to. 
and that's to do with the spatial and the temporal variations that we see in these basalts. So that's where I'm sort of heading to with this talk today. So to start off, what do I mean by a small eruptive center? Often in the earth sciences, we use um, terms such as large or small, with, and there's not much of a qualifier in there. So what do we actually mean by this? So I've got a couple of examples on the, the first slide here. Um, this is a volcano in Mexico called Volcan Joruyo, which I was lucky enough to go and celebrate its birthday a few years ago. Um, and this down here is an example from the Western US called the Sema Volcanic Field. And these are quite nice examples of these eruptive centers. They tend to have a continuous eruption sequence, so no soil breaks or hiatuses. We think that they are related to one discrete batch of magma. They're very small volumes. Um, and they tend to form either small fields or clusters. And you can see that feature really well in this image down here. We've just got a series of small cones forming a field. They are thought to only erupt once in their lifetime. I like to think of them as the one hit wonders of the volcano world. And they generally form scoria cones, short lava flows, tough rings, and these things called mars, which are circular depressions now infilled with water, which is where we have an eruption with groundwater involved. They are typically basaltic in their composition, although not always, although most of the ones I'm gonna talk about today are basaltic in composition. And we like to think that they have relatively simple compositions. Hey. But, um, Hello, are you? Sure. Sorry. <laughs> um, these are probably ideal scenarios here. And in nature, it, as with everything, it's not really that simple. And I'm gonna show you that their compositions are really not that simple when we get into it. So what's the significance of this kind of volcanism? It's the smallest end of what we call the basalt spectrum. And what I mean by the basalt spectrum is going all the way up to these massive outpourings of lava that we see in flood basalts, such as the Deccan traps, scaling back a little bit to something a bit smaller, such as Hawaiian volcanism, which is predominantly basaltic, and then all the way down to this small end of basaltic compositions with just these small cones. So that's the basalt spectrum. Um, they are significant because they are generally less affected by storage and less affected by anything going on in the crust because they rise quite rapidly to the surface. And because of this, they can show us some really unique behavior of what's happening in the mantle right at the beginning of these melting episodes. So on this slide, this is an image of Paracatin volcano, also in Mexico. Um, this is Paracatin right here. This is a very famous monogenetic eruption, and I'll be coming back to this one um, in a few slides. So again, why would, we, why would we study these? And from a purely aesthetic view, um, this is actually the, the rock that I have um, on that slide right there. Um, you can't see it so well, but um, this is a beautiful rock. It's a day site. It's from the northern Andes of Chile. It's near a volcano called Lascar, which is one of the most active volcanoes in northern Chile. It has these beautiful crystal textures in it, lots of quartz. It's a stunning rock. It's really, really beautiful. You would want to pick it up. On the other hand, we have something like I'm showing on the right side, which is from a monogenetic volcano. And this looks like a bag of gravel. It's, uh, it's, it's very unassuming. Um, it's, it's pretty boring looking, to be honest. Um, it tends to form, this is a, a, a scoria cone building sequence here. So layers and layers of this stuff, which is called lapilli, and it's basaltic. Now this to me is far more exciting than this rock over here. And I hope to convince you over the next few slides that it is really quite exciting. When we go into the field and we're studying volcanoes, um, we do tend to be gravitated towards these big strata volcanoes, which are inherently more interesting. If we play a little bit of spot the volcano in this slide, you know, it's pretty obvious where the volcano is in this top picture. This is Viarica. It last erupted in 2015. It has an active lava lake. It's a very interesting volcano. 
It's a little bit less obvious when we're looking at these small volcanoes. Um, this is in the same general area as Via Rica. This is called Cabogua. And it's just this small hill. It's about 200 meters high, very small, very easy to overlook. Um, so these are interesting because they have risen very rapidly. They don't have this big influence on the crust. And so they can really tell us about what's going down on down in the mantle um, at the point of melting. And this is shown in this schematic diagram here. This is from the same area. This is Viarica. We tend to have lots of storage areas deep in the mantle, at the mantle crust boundary, but also in the crust. And this gives a lot of processes onto the magma, which mask what's going on deep in the earth. Whereas in these smaller centers, so this is um, this one down here, this is from this cluster of cones here, we think that the magmas are coming from the mantle crust boundary and they're coming straight up. So they're not being masked by anything that's going on in this um, 38 kilometers of crust in this particular area. So they can really tell a lot about what's going on initially in the melting episode. There's been a lot of studies in um, small, basalt small basaltic systems. Um, so uh, there's, they are one of the most prolific landforms, volcanic landforms in the world. Um, they're very common in all tectonic settings, actually. So not just intraplate, but there's also lots of arc related um, small basaltic systems and also extensional. This is an example of an extremely well studied field, which I'm going to talk about today, which is Auckland. Um, there's around 50 volcanoes in the city of Auckland, and they are all of this style, this very small um, eruptive centers, scoria cones, and some lava flows. They show great compositional variety across an individual field. And this variety is not really due to the shallow processes which generally affect magmas. And I'm illustrating that using a total alkali versus silica plot here, um, silica along the bottom. This is just for a bunch of intraplate fields. So uh, this is where they are on the, um, in the world. So a lot from Auckland, but also some from China and some from Australia, the newer volcanic province, a bit more close to home. And uh, you can see that there's a big splatter of data here, a lot of variety, but mostly in the basalt sort of range. Generally on these kind of diagrams, when we see things heading off in this direction, it's due to crustal influence. It's due to fractional crystallization, um, or interaction with crustal components. When we see a lot of variation in this direction, this is generally due to source processes or the actual flavor of the mantle that is melting in these scenarios. So a lot of what we see, this variation, is not due to crustal influence. So a little bit of a sidestep here to talk about chocolate. Um, what do I mean by large variation? That's another one of these words that we use that what actually qualifies that? What does large variation mean? Because they're all just basalts, right? So how much variation do you actually get in a basalt anyway? So I've chosen to illustrate this with chocolate. Um, I'm sure you all know what Maltesers are. You have Maltesers here in Australia. I don't think you have Revels. This was one of my favorite chocolates in the UK. Revels, um, I've only ever seen them in the international section of the supermarket, so I don't think you can get them here. But essentially, Revels um, look a bit like Maltesers on the outside, but they have a whole different load of fillings in them. They're a bit like a cinema mix. You can get uh, raisin, coffee, um, orange, which is a bit gross, actually, uh, caramel, all these different flavors that are wrapped in chocolate. So they look the same, but they're, but they're very different inside as opposed to Maltesers, um, which are all the same inside. So you could say that these are very homogeneous chocolates, whereas Revels are very heterogeneous chocolates. And this is what I mean really by the variation that we get in basalts is that they, they on the face of it look very similar, but they are actually in these smaller eruptive centers, more like a bag of Revels. So I want to show a brief example of this to show just how much variation we can get in one very small area in these small basaltic eruptions. So this is um, again Via Rica, this lovely pointy strata volcano, very obvious. Um, it lies on the arc front in southern Chile. 
Um, so at the arc front, that's where we have the slab at about 100 kilometers depth below, uh, below that point. Oops, sorry. Um, it also has a large number of these small eruptive centers around it. So I've just chosen to um, plot magnesium versus strontium here. It doesn't particularly matter about the elements in this example. I just want you to see the variation. So if we went to this field area and we took um, lots of samples of Viarica, so these are just samples from Viarica at the moment, we have a nice little cluster of data there. We have the composition. If we take an example of a lava flow from each of these little black cones here, which I've now picked out, uh, these are the small eruptive centers, we see that there's a really large scatter. These could also almost be just outliers in the data set. If we supplement that data now with, um, say, 20 samples from each of those small eruptive centers, we sample the scoria cones, we sample the lavas, we can see that there's a really big range. We're clearly missing some of the detail in this area if we ignore these. And then if we then give each of these volcanic centers a, a name and we give it a different color, we can see that these are unique little pockets of magma which are making their way to the surface and actually, um, when we look into other geochemical parameters, we can look at what's causing these variations in their chemistry. So we've got lots of different processes going on and um, showing the complexity of things going on in this area, which we would have missed if we'd just gone to that one strata volcano in this area. So I think this shows quite powerfully how much extra detail these small eruptive centers can, um, can tell us. So we get some quite interesting spatial variations if we look at these fields of volcanoes. What I want to show on this slide is not the individual models here. Um, I just want to show some similarities in the models between different monogenetic fields of these small volcanoes. So this is an example from the Western US. Um, this is from the Cascades, also from the Western US. And this is our same example from Southern Chile. And things that they have um, in common between different models is that the compositional characteristics that we see um, when we analyze these basalts generally come from a deep mantle feature. So in all of these examples, all of the interesting bit is down in the mantle. This is all down in the mantle above the slab. This is all down in the mantle. And another key feature is that the preservation of that compositional signature is due to the isolation of the melting event. And that's shown on all these models by the fact that we have um, individual ascent, basically. They're not forming big compound chambers. They're literally just coming up on their own as a separate melting and ascending event. And this is preserving this wealth of uh, compositional variety that we see. This is a, a schematic that I really like that was published in 2017 to compare these short-lived and longer-lived systems, but also the complexity that we see in the range of volcanism. So on the X, sorry, the Y axis here, we've got in a volcanic sense, whether um, a, it's a very simple system or a very complex system. And on the X axis, we've got the petrogenetic sense. So this is essentially the crystal content. So are we looking at something complex like this or very simple, like the, the bag of gravel, essentially, um, going from simple to complex? So ideally, our small eruptive centers would be down in this corner here. They would be volcanologically very simple, just rising to the surface, creating small isolated cones, and they would be very simple petrologically, so in terms of their crystal content. Realistically, they're probably a bit further up on this diagram. They are a bit more complex than this diagram shows. So this is that example from SEMA in Nevada. But we see that they are chemically very complex. As opposed to maybe some of these um, longer lived, larger strata volcanoes such as Mount Hood in Oregon and the Cascades, which are really chemically quite simple. Mount Hood is actually famous for having erupted essentially the exact same compositional magma 
over hundreds of thousands of years. So it's become very homogenous. So what interests me is how we get from these chemically complex but volcanologically very simple cones through to these longer lived larger systems which become quite homogeneous in terms of the chemistry. So at what point do we lose the uniqueness of the basaltic melts to become that homogeneous magma? So essentially, how do we get from the bag of rebels here to a bag of Maltesers? So if I talk about intraplate small scale volcanism, um, the, I would consider that to be the simplest case because we don't have this interaction of fluids from the slab, sediments, crustal contamination getting in the way. If any of those signatures in the chemistry that we can look for are present, they are what we would consider cryptic. Um, and they can help us to see maybe what the tectonics were like um, in the past, but we generally don't see these effects. So intraplates, um, oibs, that's an ocean island, basalts or something like Hawaii, they have little or no effect of the crust. And these are really valuable because they can show us what the mantle um, and melting signatures are that are preserved in these basalts. And as an example, I'm gonna talk about Auckland, um, this is a primitive mantle normalized multi-element plot commonly used in geochemistry to look at particular patterns that are very characteristic of um, ocean island basalts like Hawaii, there's the pink line there, um, mid-ocean ridge basalts or archetype basalts. So here's the elements along here. You can see that in Auckland, this is just a few centers I've decided to pick out. Um, they have this quite smooth pattern without any large spikes, which shows that they are not from any kind of fluid or crustal contamination going on. So we can tell a lot about the melting parameters going on there. This is the city of Auckland, um, a beautiful image showing Mount Eden in the center. I'm sure a lot of you have been to Auckland and seen the volcanoes. This is sort of the famous volcano out in the harbor, Rangitoto, which last erupted 500 years ago beautiful map made in 1864 by Ferdinand von Hochstetter, who was the first person to map the field and it's um, 50 or so volcanoes. So it's, it's a abundantly volcanic city. This is a geochemical plot of just magnesium content with aluminium, which I've picked because it illustrates really well the variety that we see in these um, individual volcanic centers. So this is 12 volcanic centers from the city of Auckland and each color there um, is a different volcano. And you can see this enormous spread of variation that we see in the geochemistry there. So it is a very heterogeneous field. There's a lot of rebels going on in this geochemistry. It's not a bag of Maltesers at all. We did some work a few years ago looking at the size of these volcanic centers um, and how they might be linked to their, their chemistry. And this was really interesting. So eruptive volume here, this is the dense rock equivalent. And um, so once you take out the um, things like the vesicles, the gas bubbles, um, and you account for that. So increasing size along the x-axis. And we have a few things here which can give us ideas about how these melts were formed. So the silica content can tell us about the evolution um, so whether it is starting to crystallize, we have this ratio here, the calcium aluminium, which gives us an idea of the fertility of the mantle. So how much melt has already been taken out of the mantle. And this ratio we use to look at the degree of melting. So how much melting is actually happening in the mantle. And we see these really incredible correlations with size. So the larger centers are more evolved. They come from less fertile mantle and they have large degrees of melting. We managed to correlate that with melting rate, which is different to melting degree because it's essentially the, the speed and amount of, of, of which, at which melt is produced. And sounds like a logical correlation, but the larger volumes of magma were produced from a larger melting rate. That does sound obvious, but it's, um, it's, it's not a correlation that you would typically expect to see this clearly. So although we didn't see a spatial pattern, there is a very strong correlation between the size and the melting dynamics happening in, in the mantle in these volcanoes. 
I'm going to show a quick example of how I think we are starting to get homogenization of the mantle melting signature by using this particular volcano, which is called Moto Korea, um, often referred to as Brown's Island, I suspect by people who can't say Moto Korea. Um, and it's just off the coast of um, Auckland Harbour, so just out here in the harbour. It's very small, it's half a kilometre. Um, it was referred to in the 60s as a bonsai volcano, it's very cute. So it has some lava flows, um, it has some a scoria cone and rafted scoria, that's where um, the lava flows take away some of the scoria when they're erupting. And it also has this big eroded tuff ring, which we were able to sample through because of the dips of the beds. Here's a picture of my supervisor, Ian, um, collecting some of these big volcanic bombs um, for chemical analysis. So the chemistry varied in a really fascinating way as we looked through the progression of this eruption from the tuff through the scoria and finally through to the lava flows. And this gave us a lot of insight into how these kind of eruptions initiate and how they progress chemically. So I have a few different chemical things plotted here. This is total alkali versus silica uh, to look at evolution. We have calcium over magnesium, which helps us to see how much fractional crystallization is going on. And we have some lead isotopes, which tells us a bit about the mantle um, flavors that are involved. So in the tuff, we start um, with this discrete group here. But as we went into the scoria, we see these quite strong changes in the chemistry, although not in calcium, and a very big change in lead isotopes. That's a reasonably big change for such a small volcano. And then as we went into the lava, we see it increases um, in, in these differences. So it decreases in alkalis, no change in calcium, and again, a very big difference in the lead isotopes. And we interpreted this, these very strong differences as no effect of fractional crystallization. If there was, we would expect to see a trend with calcium. Um, no contamination with the crust being involved in the magmas. What we think this is, is the eventual exhaustion of some mantle flavors as the melting progressed. So can, starting to actually homogenize the, um, the melting scenario. So larger amounts of melting and incorporating more of the ambient mantle and actually diluting the interesting signature that we saw at the start. So as a little summary of intraplate basalts, the lack of crustal processing gives us really important information about the melting processes that we see and the mantle that might be involved. And combining volcanology with the detailed chemistry can give us these insights into the evolution with time and possibly how magmas start to become quite homogenous. Arcs are obviously, um, sorry, I was just looking at the time, making sure I'm on time. Um, arcs are obviously a lot more complicated because we've got all of this going on in addition to the melts being generated in the mantle. So we've got fluids, we've got crust, we're starting to get storage in chambers. Where is the mantle signature in all of this? Is it still there? Is it being diluted? But basalts in arc settings could actually be more important than, um, than in intraplate settings because they could maybe tell us about changes that are happening in the tectonics of these kind of environments. So they're a lot more complicated. The elements um, need a lot more figuring out what they maybe are, are um, related to. Um, I'm going to show an example from Southern Chile where I think we can start to get at this, at this detail. So on this plot here, this is another primitive mantle normalized plot. You can see this is very different to the one we saw in Auckland because we, we see these big sort of spikes and dips and troughs. Um, which show that there's a lot of enrichment and depletions of elements going on, which are probably related more to this process than in the mantle. So here's Chile, it's a very long country, as you probably know, this is Santiago, which is where I was based for, for three years. Um, and this is the field I'm going to talk about. It's just in um, northern Patagonia, and it's a volcanic field called the Caran los Venados field. It's just north of a more famous volcanic complex, a stratovolcano complex called Puyehue Coroncaue, which um, has been erupting 
reasonably frequently. I think it last erupted in 2012. Um, and it's a very, very large volcanic complex. You would struggle to find the small eruptive centers on this plot, uh, sorry, on this map, because they are very hard to see, but they are in this gray ellipse right here. Um, there's also an interesting fault going through um, this particular region, which probably has some bearing on where magmas end up. So a bit of Gutierrez's field photos here, because we all like that. This is a Google Earth image of part of the field, um, sort of looking a bit sort of north-ish. You can see some of these volcanoes popping out of the landscape here. So there are some quite interesting post-glacial, sorry, these are all um, Holocene lavas um, and volcanics. We have some quite interesting post-glacial lavas which underlie this volcanic field. You can see it in this, this beautiful waterfall here. And then we have some tephra falls here, which are parts of basically the side of a scoria cone, which we were able to sample uh, more of this sort of material going up through the sides of these cones. So these are Holocene tephra falls. There's some Mars. These are these circular depressions, uh, which are filled with, with water now, um, which are sort of explosive craters. And we have some very recent volcanics as well. This is an absolutely stunning volcano called Mirador. And it erupted in 1979 um, over the course of a month. It's actually quite a lot of magma to come out um, in a month. And we sampled all the way through this, hoping to find some very exciting um, geochemical variations. And spoiler alert, we didn't, um, for reasons I'm going to come to. So we sampled all the way through this cone. And we think we've probably got the very earliest tephra at the base of the cone and also the very latest lava. This is a fantastic view. I've never seen anything like this. This is the, um, the actual sort of uh, source of the lava flow. It actually all came out from this one point. So we were able to get one of the last pieces of lava that was actually erupted during this lava flow. This is a blown up image of that multi element plot so to see some of these unique differences and we see a really important change in the source characteristics between those early post glacial lavas underlying the field and the later small eruptions. So in the basal lavas, this is this green line. If I now put the field on there of these small eruptive centers, we see a really big change in the chemistry overall, particularly in these elements right here, you can see just from the, the slope of the line, this is potassium and lanthanum. We have very, um, a very strong trend there, um, as opposed to these basal lavas where they're, they're almost the same. So we can use these kind of diagrams to look at these key differences. So just putting up a couple of plots now. Um, the gray, um, the gray symbols in the background are from the big strata volcano, just so you can see the difference between them. So the basal lavas are in green. And now if I put on, um, if I put on those Holocene falls, those very small eruptions, we can see there's a really big difference. And they also cover a very big range in chemistries compared to those basal lavas. So they are very heterogeneous. It's another bag of rebels. If we plot on Mirador, which is that lovely recent example um, there, we can see that it seems to have a much more restricted range in chemistry. One might also say that it's starting to become potentially homogeneous. Um, so we think that probably the basal lavas came from a more enriched source, um, even though the small eruptive centers have a little bit more diversity in them. A little bit about uranium series. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail other than to say what we can use them to interpret. Um, again, here is the volcanic field of these small eruptive centers compared to the basal lavas in each of these plots. And again, they have a much wider diversity in their compositions. And here is Mirador. So in this diagram here, this is an indicator of much greater fluid influence in the melting region. So the small eruptive centers are picking up much more of a fluid influence. Um, and in this diagram over here, not to go into too much detail with these models, we can see that um, the melting degree 
is much larger in these smaller volcanic centers compared to the basal lavas, probably due to that larger amount of fluid, because we know that fluid decreases um, the solidus and allows us to melt things more easily. We also think that the melting rate was probably smaller conversely as well. So it's a bit of a complicated story, but we can start to actually take out some of this detail. So the basal lava seemed to be from a drier source and this small field that popped up afterwards seems to be from higher melting rates of a very fluid enriched source. Mirador seems to sit between these compositions, which could suggest that it is transitional. Um, now, I'm afraid to say that drawing is not my um, forte. So this is a dreadful schematic, but hopefully it gives you an idea of what we think is potentially happening in this volcanic field. We have this early post-glacial regime, possibly um, triggered by ice unloading. That's something that we're looking into. We have these basal lavas, which um, erupt with a higher melting rate, um, but they're drier. And then we have these Holocene falls, these small eruptive centers popping up, rising very rapidly, preserving their unique signatures in the geochemistry in a very fluid dominated melting regime with these Mars and such like, these, these scoria cones kind of popping up through that. Then we have Mirador, this most recent event, which is a little bit enigmatic because it seems to be on its way to being homogenous. Um, and I think this could suggest that we are starting to get melting rates large enough to start getting storage in the crust and some homogenization. Said I was coming back to Paricotin, and there's a reason for that. So Paricotin um, in Mexico is one of the most famous small eruptive centers in the world, if not the most famous. And it's famous because it allegedly erupted in a cornfield from nothing. So one day, absolutely flat cornfield, the next day, volcano started to grow. And it's very unusual that we ever see these kind of scenarios. So it erupted from 1943 to March 1952, so about nine years. And so it was a really unique opportunity to study the birth of a volcano and the development. And the reason why I want to focus on it just in this slide is because it has some very important compositional um, progressions in its chemistry. So along the x-axis here from this study, this is the eruption date, so this is time, and this is the silica content, and you can see that it gradually increased in its silica content as time went on. And this variation was attributed to increasing amounts of fractional crystallization, so storage, um, and assimilation. That means um, the magma is basically chewing up a lot of the crust that it was coming through. So this is showing how a magma system can start off as just a small eruptive event, but start to actually build itself into a chamber um, system of stored magmas. Um, and this is another diagram showing the same thing. So this is time going up until it stopped and various different uh, compositional uh, so parameters here there, showing some progress, uh, HK. Um, showing um, some variations that they see with time. And you can see that it becomes more dominated with crustal processes as we, as we go through its evolution with a lot of interesting stuff happening right at the beginning. So I think that is quite analogous to what we're seeing um, in Southern Chile. So to flip back to Auckland, a simple case, we have um, little or no influence of the crust so that we see these differences in, in the melting at depth. Um, we see exotic mantle chemistry becomes diluted as um, the melting event and as the eruption progresses, but we don't see it progressing to the point where it has crustal storage. Um, um, but in, in those arc examples, we do. So I think what we're looking at is some kind of a complexity threshold, as I'm choosing to call it. So the spatial variations that we see in the small basaltic systems are almost certainly due to the fact that they are small melting events that, are, um, that ascend in isolation to preserve that compositional diversity. Um, and that's shown in this, again, sorry, another terrible schematic. Um, 
of these small little centers which come up from depth. They maybe preserve some quite interesting mantle flavors. And as they get larger with larger amounts of melting, we get more incorporation of shallow material which dilutes that signal. So I think the temporal variations that we see are very dependent on the extent of the melting event. And that's certainly what we see in Auckland. Maybe it's what they saw in Paricotin as well. So we go from the bag of rebels down here in the small centers with a small amount of melting, and we end up as a bag of Maltesers with a large amounts of melting. And that's what we saw in Auckland. I showed this image before. Um, as we go from the small amounts of melting, we get a lot of this diversity, which becomes more dilute and more like a normal volcano um, as we increase this amount of melting and if we involve the crust more. So this is what I think is probably happening. So this is kind of a summary. The extent of melting in the mantle and the mantle source variation itself are intrinsic complexities which could occur in any kind of um, volcanic environment. And this gives us a kind of baseline complexity. And this is what we see in Auckland. As soon as we start to involve more complicated crustal environments, um, we get stalling, which means that the magma stagnates, it starts to crystallize. We get maybe influences of the local stress field if there are large faults and things going on which create complications. And we also have the complexity of age or longevity. How long have these magmas been around for? And these extrinsic factors, which are very dependent on the location in the world, they act to dilute or homogenize this intrinsic complexity. And this is what I think we were seeing in this example from Southern Chile. So the intraplate small eruptive events show us a lot more of this intrinsic complexity because they are less hampered by the environment that they're coming through. So just to, to end up really on a final idea, this is not my idea. This is from a colleague of mine, Eduardo Morgado, who's now at the University of Leeds. Um, is the beginning of potentially a sustained crustal storage where we start to see this, this threshold in complexity? So essentially this part here, as soon as we get um, a large enough amount of melting, um, do we start to get storage and this creates this um, dilution effect in the diversity. And how long does that actually take to come on? And I think probably the answer there lies in crystal specific studies, such as in this one, where we had, um, in this example, they looked at olivines and they looked at the zoning on the edges of those olivines. And they saw that ones, some of them must have stored for some amount of time to create those zones. And so they actually managed to get some kind of time scale information on how long it takes to start building up a storage system, even in a very small eruption. So some conclusions um, from this work, um, I've taken you all over the globe in this talk, so I hope you've, um, you've bared with me with that. A um, bit of a gushurtious picture of some cute little piggies um, from Southern Chile, these are wild boar. Um, so some conclusions are that small eruptive centers really give us this snapshot of mantle melting that is incredibly valuable. It becomes a lot more complex when we're looking at arc magmas, but using large data sets and also lots of different geochemical tools can help us to unravel that detail. Um, we see some spatial variation in some areas um, and in other areas we don't at all. And that's probably due to the fact that they are very individual melting events. And um, in some areas in southern Chile, we don't see any across arc mixing, which does show that they are essentially melted to order, rise and erupt in isolation. Some heterogeneity seems to start quite deep in the mantle, um, but then we get some overprinting later on, um, which dilutes that, that heterogeneity. So I think there is this intrinsic complexity, which is essentially to do with the mantle, um, which is imposed on, and that starts to homogenize the magma. Um, I'm coining this new phrase, the complexity threshold, um, which I think is the point at which the magma starts to homogenize. But actually, what tips that over into becoming a more homogenous magma is something that I'm still looking into.
So um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for bearing with me uh, for the technical difficulties at the start. And I really hope you could hear all of this. Thank you very much, Lucy. I certainly heard it. So <laughs> hopefully other people did too. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions for Lucy? There are a few geos in the audience, so hopefully maybe Luke. G'day. I just wanted to say that was very interesting. I've been to a lot of those volcanoes oh, good. and um, like Paracutin, I was very young yeah. when I went there, but um, no, it was very, very interesting to, to learn about these volcanoes that I've seen <laughs> and walked around <laughs> on. Um, but yeah, and if you're ever interested in more felsic volcanics, you should you should come up our way. Some <laughs> interesting ones. Yeah, we yeah. also have a lot of uh, basaltic ones that are, are lying around that have been largely neglected as well. Yeah, no, I've heard about. Um, there's there's certainly a lot of these smaller up to centres, um, sort of along the sort of the eastern side of Australia, and I don't know how much work has been done on them actually. Um, yeah, there's, um, Simon Turner's got some PhD students working on them oh, yeah. um, at Macquarie at the moment. So, you know, hopefully some things will come out on that. Yeah. 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 Because they're presumably yeah. arc related, I imagine, because they are sort of in a line, which generally. Uh, away, yeah, I think they're trying to work on that. I think there was a thought that it was a hotspot relation, but I think maybe it's might be more plate motions and there's also under thick underplating so i think there's more to come out on those ones yeah great yeah so. hmm ah thank you very much and I, I really enjoyed that particularly the paracutin i've been there so it is a it's an amazing place i uh, it was my first and i hope last time ever on a horse <laughs> yeah um, right i've I, never ridden a horse before and they put me on this animal yep. hated me for six yep. hours and it was it was awful um the volcano was amazing but the experience yes. was dreadful. no i i walked i balked at the horse because i had a bad experience with the horse so i walked yep. instead and yep. um yeah the guy my guide apparently had seen the eruption he was very old i don't know wow. it was, i felt sorry for him but yeah it's um it's actually a surprisingly large volcano for a small eruptive center, but um, certainly yeah. as big as the other Mexican volcanoes. But, um, yeah, and I was surprised at how much like ash was lying around still and things like that. Yeah, it hadn't. Yeah, oh, it's very cool. Yeah, great. I had a question um, just that I was wondering as um, you were talking, and maybe you explained it at the end, but um, I'm just a humble paleontologist, so. Uh, um, but the, the reason why things are stalling and creating these magma chambers and then becoming more homogeneous, is it, is it because of just the rate of melting is controlling the, the pooling and stalling of it? Or is it more the, or is it a combination of that and maybe the composition of the crust that it's passing through and other geophysical that's a, features? That's a really good question, actually. And it's something that we're, um, we're trying to model at the moment that is the melting rate actually the most important factor oh, in right. um, essentially, yeah, controlling whether a magmatic system becomes one of these long lived big right. systems where you end up with a big chamber just full of magma uh -huh. basically, or a series of reservoirs. Because um, if you think about just a very small batch of magma rising to the surface, there's probably so many failed attempts that never right. make it to the surface. Um, that are probably these very unique little small amounts of melting, but probably there is a point at which the, the, the melting rate is large enough that it can sustain a conduit right. and a way to the surface and um, a way of building a chamber. So I think it's actually probably the most important factor. Not uh. entirely sure how to model that. I've been trying mm. to think of it. Uranium series isotopes are a way of modeling melting rate, but... Um, they're not always available for every data set. So right. it's, hard, it's hard to come up with a sort of a, a, a big unifying model. Um, uh -huh. I don't have all that. So. And do, it might, do you think it might be different depending on each field that you look at? Like it could be something that's, that is quite unique for different places. Yeah, absolutely. Um, because um, you know, not everywhere is just a nice flat expanse of right. building with no faults and yeah. you know, a uniform crustal thickness. So yeah. um, that's why I think this is sort of a, a way I'm trying to come up with a way of 
layering models. So you've got this, yes. which could occur yes. anywhere. And then you've got this, all of these kind of layers of additional information that is very mm -hmm. specific to the, the local environment. So the stress deal, the faults, the, the, you know, mm -hmm. is the crust 20 kilometers thick, is it 40 kilometers thick? All of those things are gonna have a bearing on it. So um, yeah, that, that's going to create complexity in some way, complexity because it's going to create magma chamber development, but it's going to dilute the mantle complexity. Component. Right, yes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really interesting systems, I guess. And and I was thinking as well, like in each, uh, um, I don't think about volcanoes terribly often, but you know, it made me think about in a particular volcanic field, you're probably going to get a whole variety of different types of uh, of eruptions, I guess, or yeah. you know, related material coming out. And I've never yeah. really considered that before. Yeah, yeah, so um, what we're finding as well is that most people tend to just go and get a piece of the lava because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's kind of a bit, you know, it's nicer to hold and it's, you know, yeah, got, got a rock sample, great, tick, you know. They don't necessarily go and get a bit of ash or right. a bit of, a, of like a bomb or, um, but actually you're missing so much of the story if you don't uh -huh. pick up that stuff because you're not getting right, the right, whole right. progression of eruption. I, I think so anyway. But, yes, Yeah. that makes a lot of sense. Any other questions for Lucy? Yeah, I think Wiles got one. <clears throat> You're talking about the changes over time. Well, presumably the amount of heat available in the crust must change over time. Otherwise it wouldn't suddenly get uh, melt a patch and force its way to the surface. So what, have you any idea about the mechanisms of these movement of Hot, hot spots, if you like, in the crust as time goes by? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, because like I said before, you've probably got, in a, in a field of volcanoes where you can actually see the volcanoes, you probably have a whole lot of these failed attempts, which are just dikes below the surface, where it maybe wasn't enough magma to get to the surface, or the crust was too cold and it froze. So you probably have a lot of a lot of those kind of um, situations. So um, I know that in Auckland they have found a low velocity zone. So that's an area of where you've maybe got upwelling magma in the mantle, which could be creating some kind of um, heat feature in the crust, which makes things a bit easier to move through. But um, I think most most people who've studied kind of the, the mechanisms of how you get magma up to the surface when they are such small volumes, um, see it as a series of small dikes. And we're probably just lucky that some, well, I don't know if you call that lucky, but lucky for volcanologists that some of those eventually make it up to, to the surface. Um, yeah, because it's, it's certainly difficult to envisage how you get even a small batch of magma through 38 kilometers of crust without some, the crust being hotter or um, faulted extremely so that you, you get them through. So you don't, as, as an example, you don't tend to get these small eruptive centers in Northern Chile where you have 70 kilometers of crust because they just can't make it through. But it's, a, it's, it's an important question as well. How do you actually get them to the surface? Any more questions, anyone? You can type them in, of course, in this uh, Zoom in our format. Do you often see mantle xenoliths in these little systems? I wish we did. Um, right. <laughs> so in Auckland, um, it's very unique in that there are absolutely no mantle xenoliths. Hmm. Um, there are occasionally xenocrysts, so they are foreign crystals. Um, yep. For those who don't know what a xenocryst is, so some olivines seem to have come from extremely deep, but we don't mm. see chunks of mantle xenoliths. And actually, I've never seen any in um, in Chile either. I've seen yeah. crustal xenoliths, but not mantle xenoliths. Yeah. I guess it's just too hard to bring up lumps, or you know, is it a? I don't know like... because you do in the newer volcanic province. I mean, yeah. it's famous for it, right? Well, it's, we've. Yeah, we've got them all around the New England as well. So, yeah, yeah. but they might. 
is an interesting question. Mm. The preservation mm. of mantle xenoliths or even the, um, the mechanism where they can be included or not and why. Is the retention of them about yeah. speed? Is it about yeah. how, I, I don't know. Yeah, but of okay. course they would be very valuable because they could give us that extra snapshot of what the map mm. looks like. But um, yeah, never seen them mm. in any of the stuff I've worked on. Yeah, right. I'm just not looking hard enough, I don't know. <laughs> Surely not. <laughs> cool. I think if there's no more questions, we might um, say thank you very much to Lucy. That was awesome. Oh, thanks, guys. Thank you That's very fun. much. That was a pleasure and very nice to have a chat afterwards and get some questions. Yes. Thank you very much. That was absolutely great. Um, yeah, thanks, was, Lucy. Yes. Um, oh, uh, there was a question on the chat. Are you having any more Zoom seminars? Your presentation is very informative. Oh. So is there any other way that we can see any more of your talks, Lucy? Um, not my Maybe. specific talks, but um, if anyone's on Twitter, um, follow the Mawson Penguin, which is um, <laughs> the Adelaide Uni, um, well, it's, it's the Earth Science Department for Adelaide Uni, and we've okay. got a bunch of seminars going on as well. They are on a different day to yours, which is good. So Yes, Friday, that's so. good. Yeah. Okay, cool. The Mawson Penguin, at the Mawson Penguin. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. All right. Well, people are saying thank you on the chat. Oh. It was fascinating for non-geos. Yeah, we do have quite a lot of non-geos in the audience, and I'm really impressed that we have probably over 30 people come to our um, seminar today. Everyone's saying thank you very much. I've learned a lot. Oh. <laughs> that was from one of my students. Thanks, Donna. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Um, yes, thank you. Thanks. Take care. I might um, stop recording.